HD Smartcast. You are listening to a Mint production brought to you by HD Smartcast. Hi, I'm Satya Santanam from Mint's personal finance team. Mutual funds in India has been slowly becoming one of the most preferred investment options for Indians. Do you agree? Even our friends and family abroad would have at one point checked about the best MF plans in India. If you yourself is an NRI, I bet you would have at least thought about investing in Indian mutual funds. But it has not been made easy for NRIs from US and Canada due to complex compliance and tax rules. These countries may require you to pay taxes even on unrealized gains. That is, you will be forced to pay taxes even before selling the mutual fund units just based on paper profits each year. Especially in the US, these tax rules are introduced to discourage their residents to invest in mutual funds outside the US. We have with us Chandrika Kathu, a senior tax manager with Petronovic Park, a California-based firm, and Mohammed, founder of Westmark Tax Group in Canada, to decode the taxation of capital gains from Indian MFs in the hands of NRIs based in the US and Canada. Hi, welcome to Why Not Mint Money, a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth. So let's get started on your money journey. Income from Indian mutual funds are taxed in the US under the regime called Passive Foreign Investment Company or simply called PFEC. So any income from Indian mutual fund is taxed under PFEC for US NRIs. So there are three options um, and I use the word options a little loosely here, but there are three ways in which PFECs are taxed. There is the default method, which like I was saying when we spoke yesterday is extremely punitive. What happens under the default method is that all the income from these PFECs, whether it is um, realized or unrealized, uh, would be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. So there is a special tax available for long term capital gains. But, um, under the default method, that special tax rate is not recognized or honored. So what happens is, say that um, there is a unrealized gain of hundred dollars at the end of the year. Um, under the default method, that entire hundred dollars will be taxed uh, at the highest. Uh, tax rate that is applicable to that individual. So essentially it could be, um, you know, there is the uh, progressive tax rates that apply on ordinary income, right? The same uh, way it would apply here as well. And does it Um, differ from state to state? It does. So that's a very good uh, question. Um, For instance, California, so at the federal level, it is taxed at the, um, you know, ordinary tax rates. There is uh, no ambiguity there. The law is very clear. States have their own laws related to this. Um, and it will be important to look at each state to see whether they follow federal or not. For example, California does not follow federal law when it comes to PFIC. So they don't um, have this punitive tax methodology for uh, PFIG income in California. But um, the rest of the states, we'll have to really look at it on a case-by-case basis to see what the laws are in each of those states. Sure. Uh, so whatever the tax, uh, whatever the state charges, is it over and above what the federal uh, charges? Yes. So the way tax works in the US is there are two levels of taxation. Sure. There is the federal tax, uh, which is applicable regardless of which state you live and work in. And then there is a state level tax, which is over and above the federal tax. Um, there again, um, you know, whether you are a resident of a particular state or not, the rules and regulations for each state can be a little different. Um, but, you know, as a rule of thumb, generally, if you are living and working in a particular state, um, you would become a tax resident of that state. And uh, there are some states where uh, there's no uh, state tax as well. So like Texas or uh, Washington, um, I believe Arizona is another one where you don't have a state level taxation. So, you know, those residents only end up paying uh, federal taxes. Sure. Um, For this first case, can we take an example, Chandrika? Uh, And then uh, see how it is exactly taxed at the federal level and also at the state level. Sure. So let's say that, uh, you know, there is um, 
you know, an individual who's earning salary, who's, uh, um, you know, got some basic investments in the US, which, you know, get taxed, like which pay out interest dividend, etc. Um, and they are in the, let's say, the 32% tax bracket because of all this income. And that's the highest? That uh, The highest is 37%. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, let's say 37%. I mean, it doesn't uh, matter for the purpose of this example. Sure. Now, if that $100 that the PFIG is paying out, if let's say 80 of that is actually um, capital gain income and 20 is interest or dividend. So ideally what would happen if if it were not for this punitive um, tax uh, regime is 80 would get taxed at 15 or 20 percent which is the tax rate for long-term capital gains and only the $20 would get taxed at 37 percent. So essentially okay. you would be you know paying a lower rate even if it's say 20 percent and not the 15 percent you would be paying uh, uh, you know 17 percent lower uh, taxes overall. But if you come under the default PFIG regime, what would happen is the entire 100 would get taxed at 37%. And because of that, okay. uh, what happens is, you know, obviously, uh, if you're talking about um, realized versus unrealized, there is a cash flow issue as well to worry about, right? You're not actually realizing any gain here. Absolutely, yeah. And at the same time, you know, you're paying a very high tax on the same. Yeah. In fact, there's a cash outflow here because you're not receiving any income or the cash flow in your hands because it is unrealized. Correct. That's right. Yeah. So that's basically uh, the default method. There are two other methods. Uh, which... Sorry. Um... Uh, just sorry to interrupt you. So once uh, this federal taxation is done, how is it again? Uh, will it be applicable for a, a state level tax? So will there yeah, be so any uh, offset for paying the federal tax or? No. Mm. So state is separate. There is nothing that will offset. So let's say that, you know, the state that this person is residing in is uh, New York. And I don't know off the top of my head whether New York allows for PFIG regime or not, but let's just use New York as an example. Sure. Um, and let's say that New York follows federal, which means that it also punitively taxes PFIG income. And let, you know, the New York tax percentage, let's say that this person falls under the 6% regime um, and capital gains are at a lower percentage. So what would happen um, for New York as well is the entire 100 would be taxed at the highest marginal tax rate, which in our example is 6%, instead of, you know, say 2 or 3%, which may be the capital gains tax. And again, you know, these are just uh, random percentages I'm throwing out. I don't have the uh, New York, uh, you know, state tax rates uh, uh, off the top of my head. So essentially what is happening at the state level is, I mean, there is the 37% at the federal level and then there's the additional 6 or 7% or whatever at the state level, which takes the entire, you know, uh, taxable income to a pretty high uh, tax rate uh, category. If you include both federal and state, I mean, we, you know, in our example, it's 43% in total, right? So um, that's the... Uh, a very high rate of tax for income, especially if it is not even realized. Uh, so now we talked about investments uh, in the foreign country. Uh, it could be new investments, but what about the investments that are already there? Say, suppose there is a person who has moved from India to US uh, in the last one to two years, and they must be holding some mutual fund investments in their account in India by then already. Uh, so what about the taxation on such investments? Uh, it's the same tax treatment? It is, yeah. There's no grandfathering to answer your question. And what, um, so when you become a tax resident of the US, let's talk about that a little bit, right? Um, so you become a tax resident of the US under two uh, uh, categories. One is if you're a green card holder, um, you know, let's say you received your green card even before you set foot in the US. And as a green card holder, you moved to the US in, say, November of 2022. 
then what would happen is you would become a tax resident of the US from the date you set foot in the US on a green card so from say you know you moved on 5th of november then that date will be your date of tax residency in the US sure that's the first uh, uh, category the second category is somebody who moves on any of these other visas right like we see the h visa student visa i mean student visa we won't talk about because that's a uh, law unto itself and um, i mean we can talk about it if you think it's of relevance to this but i won't touch upon it unless you want me to um so any other category of visa that you move into the us on there is a substantial presence test and the substantial presence test is essentially based on the number of days so um 183 days is the threshold and the way you calculate that is you take all the days in the us in the current year plus 1/3 of all us days in the previous year plus 1/6 of all us days in the year prior to that and if the total of this is greater than 183 days then you would be considered a us tax resident and when you are a us tax resident you are subject to tax on your worldwide income so before you become a us tax resident let's say that you know you divest all your mutual funds you convert your mutual funds into actual equity holdings because that won't trigger pfic then you are okay but once you become a us tax resident um regardless of when the mutual funds were purchased it may have even been 10 20 30 years ago it doesn't matter you are subject to tax on your worldwide income and your mutual fund investments outside of the us will automatically come under the pfic category uh let's talk about the other two options as well this is where you know it becomes a little extra technical so i'll try and keep it um, as simple as possible but you know if there's something that um does it make sense please feel free to stop me and uh, ask me questions sure thanks so the the first uh, you know the second option is uh, you know the QEF election that's the qualified uh, uh, election fund election and that needs to be made in the first year in which the uh, taxpayer files a tax return and essentially what you're doing when you you know opt for this QEF way of taxation is you're still able to treat capital gains as capital gains and therefore um you know get the benefit of the better capital gains tax rates and any other income that the mutual fund distributes you would um still be uh, you know paying ordinary income tax rates on that so if there is an interest or a dividend etc that still would fall under the ordinary income category but the great thing is that capital gains which is where majority of the of the income is anyway generated and distributed you um, would be able to uh, you know take the benefit of the lower tax rates over there. it's a no brainer to choose this option right this qe it is it is i mean most people um, that i have you know worked on um, they have they they do choose this option um, the only problem is that it has to be done in the first year a retroactive election is available in very very rare circumstances and um, those circumstances a mutual fund does not typically uh, meet that category um, you know the the cri- the criteria rather to fall into that category uh, there are some um, you know like if it's a pooling like a private pooling vehicle like a aif equivalent sometimes they may um f- uh, meet the rules of the exception but otherwise for mutual funds it's really important that they elect it in the first year and continue um, to make the election on every year could you year. elaborate on that what would you mean by election so when you have a pfic there is a particular form that needs to be filed along with the tax return it's the uh, form 8621 um sure. you know which is an additional form that uh, along with the us tax return um it needs to be filed and as a part of that elect um, that form some of the things that need to be reported is you know what are the mutual funds that you own what are the number of shares um or units in that mutual fund what is the value at the end of the year and there is a section where you elect for this particular mutual fund to be treated as a qef which means that you know you get that um, that beneficial uh, uh, categorization of income that i was talking about and this needs to be done for each mutual fund 
and it needs to be done in the first year that you become a US tax resident and have a PFIC. If somebody doesn't know about it and if they would have missed it, then it would be a very great, <laughs> you know, problem, right? It would be. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, you and I both know, right? Ignorance of law is not an excuse. <laughs> so it's right, um, right, unfortunate. Right. That, which is why, you know, whenever there is a foreign investment, I always recommend that at least in the first year, it's important to consult with a US CPA. Um, after that, a lot of times, um, you know, these TurboTax and some of these other tax softwares work extremely well in continuing to support. Um, but the first year or two years, still, you understand, um, you know, the uh, overview of how US taxation works. Like, I feel like it's important to uh, uh, get professional advice. The third category of taxation is the mark to market. There, you know, you would... Um, uh, at the end of the year, uh, uh, see what the fair market value is and the difference between the fair market value and the adjusted cost would be um, taxed. I mean, you're paying, uh, prepaying, you know, the uh, tax on a mark to market basis. Um, here, of course, the advantage is that if there is a loss, you get to claim that loss uh, just depending on the fair market value. Um, it has to be a marketable security, which uh, mutual funds would fall under that category or tick that box um, and you know there um, again you have to make a separate election so the same form that I was talking about the mark, mark to market election if that's what we choose to do uh, we uh, would still need to make the election on a separate part of the form again the overall form filing requirements that a separate form is required for each fund etc will not really change uh, but you know the section where you'll make the election for QEF and mark to market is different. Um, so, you know, there are these two options that are available, but uh, QEF is typically uh, the the more beneficial one in most uh, cases of mutual funds. I'm just trying to understand the difference between option one taxation and option three taxation. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so the basic difference is, um, you know, in the event of a loss and the adjusted basis. So what happens in the case of the first option is um, there is the the punitive uh, you know tax basis and then there is also something called excess distribution which may be taxed in the first category um what happens under excess distribution is if your distributions in this year is greater than 125 percent of the distributions in the last two years then um you would not only be taxing the current year income, but also some portion of the last two years income in the current uh, year that under the default option I'm talking about. Whereas under mark to market, what happens is the excess distributions, one, are not taxed. Two, uh, you know, any losses are available to set off against uh, gains. And three, um, you know, and the basis is adjusted to the extent of the gain or the loss. So any gain that you're paying, uh, you know, uh, tax on, the notional gain that you're paying tax on will go to increase the adjusted basis and any losses will go to decrease the adjusted basis. So essentially, um, at least your basis to that extent is getting adjusted on a year on year for you to, um, uh, you know, ensure that when you're paying the tax, you're capturing that cost basis at least, uh, you know, to uh, get that step up. Such a complex subject it is. So folks, if you are planning to move to the US and if you are already uh, having some MF investments in India, make sure you can get in touch with a tax consultant there in the first year itself to sort out the compliance issues. Otherwise, in the worst situation, you may end up paying more taxes than the capital gains earned. That's horrible. Anyways, let's now invite Mr. Mo Ahmed to tell us about the Canadian tax rules for mutual fund gains. Yeah, so I guess the in Canada, taxation is based on tax residency. So the first step is to determine whether the individuals are tax resident of Canada or not. And this is irregardless of immigration status. So an, an individual can be, you know, uh, uh, on a work permit, temporary work permit, but be a resident of Canada. 
or an individual can be a Canadian citizen, um, but be a non-resident of Canada. Okay, so this tax residency is just for tax purposes. So, uh, is it not based on the number of days? No, not necessarily. So okay, there's okay. two ways that an individual can be resident in Canada. Sure. So um, one is on the number of days. So if an individual is is physically present in Canada for more than 183 days in a calendar year, then sure. they will be sure. deemed to be resident, um, tax resident under the Canadian tax rules. Okay. Now that deeming provision can be overridden by an applicable tax treaty. So Canada has a tax treaty with India and with the U.S. So if under the domestic rules of the other country, like India or the U.S., they are resident there for tax purposes, then that might override the Canadian domestic rule. Okay. But generally speaking, if you're here more than 183 days, you would be considered a tax resident. The other way that you could be considered a tax resident is just based on facts and circumstances rule. So let's say an individual moves to Canada in November of this year and, you know, establishes a home here and is settled into regular life in uh, Canada. In that situation, even though they will only be resident or present in Canada for two months, if they consider their home, then they will be considered tax residents from the date that they move into Canada, okay. just based on facts and circumstances. Okay, so those are the two ways. One is the statutory, you know, minimum deeming provision that sure. if you're here 183 days physically, and you have no ties to Canada, like you're living in hotels and not permanently, sure, sure. you could be a tax resident. But the other way is under the common law facts and circumstances test. Sure. So if it's a non-resident of Canada, so the main difference between resident and non-resident is a resident of Canada is taxable on worldwide income. Okay, so... Um, if a it's person just is like US, right? Uh, even in the US, it's uh, the ta- it is taxed uh, for the on the global income. Exactly, exactly. Sure, so sure. if you're a resident, taxable on on global income. So in the situation of a non-resident, they don't need to file. You know, they don't need to report offshore investment income on the Canadian side. Um, so, you know, we're talking about tax residents of Canada. They need to declare their worldwide income. Um, And there's um, two parts to it. One is they need to declare any investment income they've earned. So that would include interest income earned abroad. And I know in the case of India, there's some um, special Indian tax statuses with certain types of interest. Um, And, you know, you need to look at those from a Canadian perspective. And usually all of that is taxable in Canada even if there's like say deferral in India or, you know, some special treatment, um, you know, it'll be considered taxable income in Canada. Normally, if it's foreign investment income, you can take a a tax credit. So if any tax is paid in India, whether it's a withholding tax or, uh, you know, an actual tax, you um, you can take that as a foreign tax credit on the Canadian return when reporting that income. Okay, so interest income is fully taxable. Um, Uh, Okay, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rental income. So if there's rental property or investments in kind of rental, um, uh, you know, um, institutions, all of that income is taxable. Okay, Um, and again, you um, can take a tax credit for any tax paid to India. Then there's uh, capital gains, okay. Capital gains are taxable on fifty percent of the actual gain is taxable in Canada. So let's say you have shares that you sell and you make a, a hundred dollar capital gain. Only fifty dollars is reportable in Canada as a taxable capital gain, and that will be subject to the individual's marginal tax rate. So whatever level of um, income they have, there's different tax brackets. 
So 50% of the capital gain is taxable and is included on the Canadian return as part of their regular income. Okay. Now sure. you're saying, uh, let me just repeat that. Uh, let please let me know if my understanding is correct. So, if there is a capital gain of about two lakh rupees uh, in India, so that would be con- converted to the uh, Canadian dollars, and then a fifty percent of it would be taxed here in Canada as long term capital gains, long term or short term capital gains. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. In Canada, there's no distinction between short long. and long term as there is in the U.S. Yeah, sure. in Canada. Just um, you know, straight taxation. Okay. Um, okay, and then the one other important thing to remember is that when moving to Canada, you have what's called a deemed acquisition of your assets at fair market value. Sure. So you know your cost basis for Canadian purposes will be fair market value on the date that you become a resident. So in this case, you know, you may have had a lot of capital gain before you became a resident, right. but it's not taxable when you sell. Um, you know, so that could be a planning point if somebody has a lot of capital gains, they move to Canada and then sell their shares. Okay. They wouldn't pay any tax, um, you know, other than what they've earned after Canada comes back uh, uh, after they've moved to Canada. Okay. So th- it's it's like the grandfathering clause, right? So correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gain so, still the date of uh, moving to Canada will will not be taxed in Canada. Only from that day, maybe a fair market value will be considered to consider correct. the capital gains. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And then um, there's also a deemed disposition rule. I don't know if this is you know applicable or not, but just for sake of completeness. So if you move to Canada and you have, like, say, a large portfolio and then you decide you're going to move out of Canada, Canada has a deemed disposition rule. So on the date you become a non-resident, you're treated as if you sold all of your investment assets at fair market value on the date that you become a non-resident. So it's important to plan if you're going to be moving to Canada. Okay. Um, Now, the Canadian tax treatment of it, you really need to do a review of the structure of the foreign kind of holding and then, you know, look through it to see what is the reporting that's required. So, you know, in in a lot of cases, it's just not practical if the information is not available to do the similar type of reporting in Canada, right? Um, It's from a practical perspective, we file a lot of tax returns And, you know, normally we would, uh, you know, just um, do kind of a a best case kind of assessment. Like if there is, um, you know, income that's being allocated to an individual's account, even though it's not being distributed, you know, those types of items you probably need to declare each year, you know, as they're allocated to an individual's account. But if they're holding units of a mutual fund, and otherwise there's no real allocation to the individual you know practically speaking it's going to be very difficult to determine how much income is you know um, attributable to that individual so if it's not huge amounts we would just you know report it as a capital gain when they eventually sell the mutual funds okay um so the rules in canada is not as clear as the PFIC rules in the U.S., you know, they're sure. very highly defined. In, in terms of reporting? Correct, yeah, yeah. I mean, the yeah. U.S. system is very much regulated, right? You've got the income tax code and then the income tax regulations, and they spell out what you have to do. In Canada, it's more of a general tax system, and there's definitely rules for, you know, taxation of these types of entities, but... Um, You have to take those general tax rules and apply it to the individual holding. And it could be different structures, right? It depends on whether that foreign mutual fund is a corporation or is it structured as a trust or, you know, a partnership, that type of thing. Um, So, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit more gray to really figure out um, how to do the reporting. 
if it's large amounts, then you know usually we would review the you know the individual situation and come up with um, you know the game plan. If it's not large amounts, then we would normally just treat. And if there's no distributions, like if you have a mutual fund, Indian mutual fund, and the individual just holds it and then sells the units of the mutual fund and you know makes a capital gain or loss, normally we will just report that capital gain or loss, treat it like as if, you know, that it's just, they, they just own the units of it. You know, in most cases, it depends on obviously the amounts involved, but most cases that's, you know, acceptable by Revenue Canada and they don't usually have a problem with it. Okay. Um, sure. Are, are there any uh, unrealized tax on the unrealized gains by any chance, just like in the US for a couple of instances? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, technically, you can have situations where you look through the, you know, the individual's ownership of a unit and look to the underlying activity in the, you know, in the, um, in the, the entity. But if there's, you know, there's rules, like usually if it's like a large public kind of company, you, you may not need to do that. Um it's the, these rules are intended more for individuals that are you know setting up uh, it's closely held kind of foreign um entities okay so a lot of those rules um wouldn't apply um but yeah we don't do we don't have this concept of prefix and um you know it's not as defined as in the US rules okay um now i mean if somebody had a holding of let's say a uh, hundred thousand or more in a foreign mutual fund, then I would do more detailed review of that exact structure and, you know, provide more detailed guidance on how to report that in Canada. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so now, there is a, a foreign reporting requirement. Um, sure. It's called the Forum T1135. Sure. Okay. So Canadian individual, uh, resident individual that has more than 100,000 Canadian dollars outside sure. of Canada, sure. either in cash investments or, you know, stocks, needs okay. to declare okay. that each year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they will definitely need to um, it, report that on that sure. T1135. And that's sure. where CRA may ask. You know, okay, what is this, and uh, you know, what are you doing with it? So, yeah, it'll be important to understand those disclosure requirements as well. Okay. Understand. Uh, in yeah. India, the capital, long-term capital gains. Uh, maybe I'm just talking about long-term capital gains, which are taxed at the rate of ten percent after giving exemption uh, up to a limit of one lakh Indian rupees. Uh, so the rest of his tax at the rate of ten percent. Um, mm -hmm. So in Canada, 50% of the capital gains are taxed as capital gains here. What is the rate at which these capital gains are taxed? And once it is taxed, um, is there any treaty that would allow uh, NRI in Canada to offset the taxes that are paid in India? Yeah, so the taxation in Canada, like I said, only 50% of it is taxable. And then it's at the marginal tax rate of the individual. So there's no set separate uh, capital uh, gains. Yeah. Oh, so so yeah. there's no separate rate for capital gains. Understand. Okay. Right. And this and marginal no, tax rate maximum would be how much? So it depends on the province that they live in. Okay. It's going to be um, anywhere up to, I think the highest rate is 54% in um, Quebec. That's, you know, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a lot. Yeah. Although, I mean, in that case, the top rate is going to be 27%, right? Because only 50% of the actual ta of the actual gain yeah, is yeah. taxable. So the maximum rate is 27% on capital gains, right? That's one way to look at it. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And um, there's no exemptions. And then um, uh, what was the other question? Uh, I was um, talking about the treaty with India and whether oh, there yeah. is any exception yeah. for the tax paid yeah. in India. So yeah, Canada will allow, this is just one of the provisions, but it's the main one. So Canada will allow any tax. That, so if there is some capital gains tax payable in India, 
then Canada will allow a, a tax credit um, on that portion. But remember I mentioned the deemed acquisition rule? Yeah. So somebody that moves to Canada. So, you know, the tax, the capital gains for India purposes may be very different than the capital gain for Canadian purposes. Sure. So only a prorated amount of the tax paid in India would be creditable in Canada. So, for example, if somebody had, you know, shares of IBM and they had a $50 gain on it and before they moved to Canada and it's worth $100 when they moved to Canada and then they sell it in Canada after making another $50 gain. So then only half of the tax paid to India would be deductible in Canada because only half of the capital gains is reported in Canada. Right. Does that make, right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Only half of the tax paid in India will be carried as, uh, will be considered as deduction in Canada. Just in that example. Compared to mutual funds, investing in PMSS, Indian Portfolio Management Services firms, seems to be a better idea from tax perspective for NRIs based in US or Canada. This is because foreign PMS investments do not attract tax on unrealized gains just like mutual funds do. Let me end this podcast with a note from Mr. Rajiv Tucker, Chief Investment Officer of PPFES Mutual Fund. Quote unquote, he said, investors from US and Canada are taxed on unrealized gains from Indian mutual funds on an annual basis. PMS is a better option than mutual funds for NRS from these countries only for tax reasons. Tucker mentioned this talking about the PMS services of their firm in their annual general meeting for 2022. That's all for now in this episode, listeners. If you have any queries or suggestions, you can reach out to me on Twitter. My handle is at Satya Sontanam, S-A-T-Y-A-S-O-N-T-A-N-A-M. Or you can also write to us at mintmoney at livemint.com. This was a Mint production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.